1928. First of all, in case anybody has uh, not realised what, what they are, they call the sound books. People ask them why they call mirrors. Well, they act a bit like a mirror, they reflect the sounds. They pick up sounds and they listen to them their craft engine. They put them into the face of the mirror. It's reflected forward, so there's a focal area. They're designed to have lots of different focal areas, these mirrors. And so to collect the sound, operator would stand just where I am now. On this concrete plinth here, there was originally a little pyramid of concrete, on top of which there was a little framework to protect the operator. The operator stood, and in front of him, he was going to be back to you like this, after the next one, vertical pole, a steel pole, on top of that a horizontal one, and on the end of that a collecting trumpet. A tube ran a trumpet, the arm and uh, stethoscopes worn in the ear of the operator, like a doctor's stethoscope. He then used this thing to search the focal area of the mirror. On his equipment there were bearings uh, showing the, the angle at which he was aiming. So when he heard an aircraft sound, he could zero in and he searched for the loudest point. That gave him a bearing of the aircraft. If there was another person using one of these a few miles away that way, another one down there, and they're all connected to a central control room, which they were, which was at high, they can get cross bearings on the aircraft and find its position fairly well. You can see all straight away, can't you, that there might have been problems. What happens if it's a very windy day, like today? The wind would interfere with the listeners. That was the reason they had stethoscopes, to get them right into the listeners' ears, so they could try to keep out external sounds, but that was one of the problems. But anyway, they did use them in the early days. These type of mirrors date back to the First World War, when there were smaller versions of these used in, in, in France in the First World War. And uh, just at the, at the end of the First World War, there were two mirrors like this. They're actually operational that picked up German Gotha bombers coming on the east coast along here. Uh, one of the mirrors was at Josh Jack near Broadstairs, the other one was at Fan Bay at Dover. These two were sort of about 15 feet diameter, and they actually plotted some uh, Gotha bombers that were plotting the coast. I don't know whether anything followed, but it did anything. But, so they were sort of used operationally in a very simple way in that, in the, at the end of the First World War. That little station at Joss Gap went on to develop various acoustic devices. It closed down in 1923, and it moved to Hyde, and at Hyde on the hills called the Roofs to the west of Hyde, they set up an acoustic station which eventually controlled six mirrors in this region, including these mirrors here, two at Hive, one of which is now collapsed, one of which is now They work together as a system, uh, sending all the information to a control point at Hive, and eventually during air exercises in the 1930s, they were then sent on to um, RAF Uxbridge, where there was a headquarters there. So they were an experimental air defence system. The idea was they were going to have a whole lot of these all around the coast of South East England, um, and these were the prototypes. The two main types were going to be that one there, and this one over here, which we're going to go to. Because it all fell through when radar came along. There were active plans to develop a whole chain of these listening stations along the east, along the coast, and including abroad. And uh, in Malta, for instance, the only other mirror that I know of overseas is a copy of that. These are the prototypes, one like that in Malta. We'll talk about that more when we get over there. So the idea is that if you try to listen to low pitch sounds, which aero engines tend to emit, it's an advantage to have a good big reflecting surface. So they went for bigger and bigger mirrors. So they soon disbanded these and began to use that type of mirror, which is more sophisticated and is bigger. But it was the same principle. This one dates from 1928, that one dates from 1930. The station here was equipped with a little railway that ran off the Romney Hyde and Dimchurch railway, which brought the supplies to build the mirrors and later the personnel to operate them. If we just walk a few yards over there, I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about that. See, look, went down into the listening chamber. The ground level has dropped all that way. There's a flight of steps there going down. The big chamber with the swastika on it was underground.
his head. He had a steering wheel on the end of the pole, came right through it those days, and he had a steering wheel which he used to control movement in that direction, and he had some pedals which he used hydraulically to control the listening device in that direction. It worked in the same way as I explained with that mirror, on the end of that tube, which originally was like that, there was a collecting trumpet, and he moved it around, and as he listened to his stethoscope, he could pick up the bearing where the loudest engine sound came from, and that gave him the bearing on an aircraft. Then he transmitted by telephone to a, a control point. So he's in a much more sheltered position, so the elements didn't bother the listener here as much as he did in the others. And this was going to be the prototype for a whole set of these 30-foot mirrors. There's only one other I know of, and that's at Hyde, which was built just before this, actually. And then they built this one, the big improvement. The one at Hyde is in a very ruined state, but if any of you go for walks on the roofs at Hyde, you can still see it standing there with holes in it, and it's vandalised, and it's in a shocking state. So this would be the, the pucker one. The proper 30-foot mirror is going to be the, uh, a lot of these built all along the coast, interspersing with the big one. So we'll go around and talk about the big one in a minute. So any questions I can try and answer about this one? Silence. Good, I like that. Right, we're going to go through. Could they, they make, uh, you know, if they heard uh, an aircraft, well, yeah, it, it's very difficult to answer questions like that, especially if I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you that there are lots of records that he kept, you know, when they did the exercises. I should explain, these were mirrors were used in air exercises in the 1930s, when the RAF came and did simulated raids with biplanes, which didn't fly too fast, fortunately, because that was the problem. And um, how accurate they were, I have a piece of paper somewhere, but within a few degrees, they were quite accurate. And uh, the, the range is the other problem, of course. How far could they listen? I have Dr. Tucker's own figures somewhere here. I'm just fine. I'm on one of my lecture notes here. Uh, but the range of these mirrors uh, varied. It's not quite to the size of them. Yes, here we are. On a good day, Dr. Tucker recorded ranges of 17 to 18 miles of this mirror on a good day, on a good night. It was even better at night when it was very quiet and there was no environmental sounds. With the big mirror, which we're going to go to in a moment, they, they got ranges of um, uh, 27 miles in really good conditions. Uh, that was from Dr. From Dr. Tucker's own notes about them. So they were sort of effective, but there were many, many, many problems. And one can't help but think that wrestling to solve acoustical problems, and you think of the atmosphere and all the problems with sound travelling through it, the weather, one thing and another, the increasing speed of aircraft, they were problematic. But of course they got nothing else until radar came along, so they kept trying to experiment and improve them, and uh, eventually when radar came, of course they were obsolete.